All right, so thank you all for joining us today for another session of the uh, PCE3 seminar series. And uh, PCE3 stands for uh, Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments, and it's a uh, NASA RCN that, um, oh, sorry, hold on one second. I was getting a bad echo, so sorry about that. But um, so it stands for PC, uh, Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments. And it's a NASA RCN that aims to bring together early earth geoscientists and prebiotic chemists to study the origins of life. And so in a lot of our previous seminars, we've been uh, focusing on some prebiotic chemistry. So today we'd like to, we wanted to invite some speakers that could shed more light on some of the early earth environments that might lead to the origin of life. And when we invite our speakers, we try to focus on uh, bringing in early earth early career researchers. And today we're gonna to be hearing from uh, Daman Veer Garaval, who's a PhD student, and Cheng Wang Sun, who, is a who just uh, joined UT Austin as an assistant professor. Um, and so one quick note, we're gonna keep the chat closed until the end of this, end of the, uh, all the presentations. So if you have any questions, try to keep note of that and uh, save that till the end. And before we hear from Dom and Veer and Chen, Chen Guang, we're going to first have a short overview from uh, Rajdeep Dasgupta, who is a professor in the Maurice Ewing Endowed Chair at Rice University. And Rajdeep is a recipient of uh, numerous awards, such as HU's James B. McElwain Medal and the uh, Hisashi Kuno Award. And his research focuses on planetary differentiation, origin and cycling of life essential elements in rocky planets, mantle climate feedbacks and magmatic and geochemical processes of earth and planetary interiors. Uh, so thank you for joining us, joining us Raj and uh, go ahead. Can you guys all share the screen? Yeah, it looks good. And hear me all right? Yeah, you sound good. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the focus of our group's research and the theme of today's presentations. Uh, in the Clever Planets research program, we are interested in the origins and cycles of life essential elements uh, in rocky planets with a focus on how the young surfaces of rocky planets acquire and sustain volatile elements, such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, and um, sulfur, which are all essential for life. In other words, uh, we are aiming to understand conditions of chemical habitability uh, by combining astronomical observations uh, of other solar systems theories of planet formations and evolution from astrophysical and geodynamical standpoints, as well as uh, origins uh, and fates of key elements from geochemistry, cosmochemistry, uh, and petrology, um, including uh, geothermal processing, organic geochemistry, and so on and so forth. Given the focus of our group is understanding habitability, habitability of rocky planets, we focus um, quite a bit inward uh, or look inward. In other words, we look towards the history of our own solar system and in particular toward the history of uh, our own planet, the planet Earth, uh, the only known inhabited planet. Uh, and I show a picture of uh, our own rocky planet here. Uh, however, if I showed you this particular picture uh, of planet Earth, you will agree that our planet actually does not look like this. Our planet actually looks more like this, where the surface is covered with life essential elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. In other words, there is a um, concentration of life essential elements on the surface in the, in the form of fluids and gases, which is essential for life. So a key question that we are interested in addressing uh, in this interdisciplinary consortium Clever Planets in understanding the, the abundance and, 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 and origins of these volatiles and how they are maintained, especially towards the earlier years of the planet's formation and Earth's origin. Okay. 
Um, we are taking a whole planet scale approach because over millions and billions of years, the surface inventory of bioessential elements rely on the interior surface exchange. And actually on Earth, um, the atmosphere, biosphere, um, and, and hydrosphere all exist by the permission of the mantle. There are many endogenic and exogenic processes that sculpted the fate of um, life essential volatile elements uh, and phosphorus in young Earth, including planet formation, magma ocean degassing, crystallization, uh, tectonics, impact processes, magmatic and hydrothermal processes. In today's presentations, you will see that the focus will be on uh, two of these uh, important processes. The first one will be the formation of rocky planets in the inner solar system. And the second one will be the role of magmatism and magmatic degassing. For the first presentation that is about the origin of major volatiles on earth, the current paradigm has mostly been that the volatiles um, came from chondritic meteorites from the asteroid belt. But perhaps that narrative is uh, shifting somewhat as there are challenges in explaining the terrestrial volatiles simply from chondritic laid veneers. Uh, we will hear from Daman um, the roles of metal silicate um, and atmospheric fractionation and what roles those processes potentially play in explaining the silicate outer layers uh, volatile abundances. Uh, and what processes uh, that magmatic differentiation, metal silicate differentiation potentially played in explaining the origin of volatiles uh, during planet formation. In the second talk, uh, the focus will be uh, on early Earth's atmospheric chemistry, which is originally influenced by um, at, at, least the, at least the initial part by accretion, core formation, magma ocean crystallization, impacts, and finally, by magmatic degassing. In Chen's presentation, the main emphasis will be on the roles of magmatic crystallization on the released gases. In particular, the focus will be how the volcanic gas chemistry might have varied through time as the continental crust developed and matured, as um, our Earth may have uh, looked an evolution of the crust from a very, very thin crust through a relatively mature uh, continental crust through uh, a relatively thick matured continental crust. So Chen might be asking a question, how the gas chemistry may have evolved as the magmatic crystallization took place from, our, uh, from under a relatively thin crust to a relatively thicker crust and how the gas chemistry and accordingly uh, that gas chemistry may have influenced uh, the buildup or the lack of buildup of oxygen at different portions of the early history of the planet. With that, I'll pretty much uh, give the floor over to the two speakers. That's all I have. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Raj. So I guess our next speaker is gonna be Daman Veer Garvel. So I guess you can start to get your uh, slides ready and I'll give you a short introduction. And so Daman is uh, about to finish his PhD as a NASA finest fellow at Rice University. And he's going to soon be moving to Caltech as a Bar Foundation postdoctoral fellow. And Don Veer's research focuses on the origin of life essential elements in rocky bodies of the solar system. And he combines high pressure experiments with meteorite data to help understand the conditions that might lead to the formation of a habitable planet. And so uh, go ahead, Don. Uh, I think you're still muted, maybe. Uh, are you able to unmute? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you're unmuted now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, can you see the screen right now? Yeah, everything okay. looks good. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about 
the origin of life essential volatiles in the rocky bodies of the solar system. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with my PhD advisor uh, at Rice, Rajiv Dasgupta, with Bernard Mati at CRPG uh, Nonsei, and a couple of summer interns uh, at Rice, uh, Taylor and uh, uh, Lexi Farnell. So here is a picture that shows the comparison of the four terrestrial uh, planets in our solar system. The terrestrial planets are rocky planets. Amongst these planets, Earth is a habitable planet uh, and is the only habitable planet that we know of as of now, while Mercury, Venus, and Mars are inhabitable. Mercury and Mars have next to no atmospheres, while Venus has an extremely thick atmosphere, which is primarily composed of carbon dioxide, leading to very high surficial temperatures, while Earth has liquid water on its surface and has clement temperatures on its surface as well, which uh, help in the habitability of our planet. So if you look at the atmospheric composition of our planet, uh, it is primarily composed of uh, molecular nitrogen, then there's some amount of oxygen, then the trace amount of some noble gases and compounds of nitrogen and carbon. Also, if you look at the basic building blocks of life on our planet, that is the DNA and the RNA. They are primarily composed of these particular atoms, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. As these elements are primarily present in the atmosphere, these are volatile elements, and they, are, they, are, uh, they play a key role in, in, in the building blocks of life, that is the DNA and RNA structure, so they are the life essential volatile elements. So that's why we classify carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen as life essential volatile elements on Earth. So the atmospheric composition on our planet is set by the exchange between the Earth's interior and exterior. Material is, uh, material is delivered towards the interior of the planet at the subduction zone, and material is released from the interior of the planet at volcanoes, and these volcanoes over long time scales set the atmospheric composition of our planet. So if you look over here for the life essential elements, the composition of these elements in the Earth's exosphere is set by the material exchange between the interior and the exterior of the Earth. So if you want to understand the origin of these life essential elements in the Earth's atmosphere, we need to look at the abundances of these elements in this particular box That's, that is termed the bulk silicate Earth. So bulk silicate Earth is primarily composed of everything in the Earth except the Earth's core, which is an isolated reservoir post core mental differentiation. So the, the primary uh, uh, methods to which people look at the, uh, uh, the origin of life essential volatile elements in rocky bodies is primarily through isotopic compositions of these volatile elements, primarily nitrogen and hydrogen isotopic compositions. If you look at the nitrogen and hydrogen isotopic composition of the bulk silicate earth represented by a red colored star over here, it's very different from this symbol that is the, cometary uh, that is the nebular gas reservoir as well as the cometary reservoir. So from this figure, we can safely say that nitrogen and hydrogen in the, uh, in the bulk silicate Earth were not sourced from the nebular gas as well as from the cometary reservoir. However, if you look closely, this red color, the nitrogen and hydrogen com isotopic composition of the bulk silicate Earth are very similar to those of the carbonaceous chondrites. So what are carbonaceous chondrites? So carbonaceous chondrites source primitive material that are created primarily in the outer regions of the solar system. So the idea is that these volatile elements, nitrogen and hydrogen, would are sourced from a similar reservoir as the carbonaceous chondrites, which come from the outer regions of the solar system. Another key interesting factor, uh, if you look at nitrogen and hydrogen in the bulk silicate earth, is their extreme depletion in the bulk silicate earth. So over here, we have plotted the, the abundances of different classes of elements in the bulk silicate earth, normalized to some primitive chondrites. If you look at nitrogen and carbon, they're extremely depleted in the bulk silicate earth. So the, uh, the general idea up till now has been that the most of the rocky planets in the, uh, in the inner regions of the solar system, they started almost volatile free. And then these volatiles were delivered by these primitive carbonaceous chondrites from the outer regions of the solar system. In this talk, I'm going to primarily challenge both of these assumptions and try to convince you otherwise. So to understand this problem in detail, we need to look at the initial architecture of the solar system. Our solar system was formed by the collapse of a molecular cloud that led to the formation of a protoplanetary disk. It was earlier assumed that in the protoplanetary disk, there was large scale mixing between the inner and outer solar system reservoirs. However, recent discoveries of several of nucleosynthetic anomalies of several non-volatile elements have shown 
that inner and outer solar system reservoirs have completely distinct isotopic compositions. Over here, I've plotted the carbonaceous chondrites that come from the outer solar system and ordinary chondrites and satellite chondrites, and including all the other terrestrial planets, they have isotopic composition that is distinct from the outer solar system reservoirs. So now the understanding is that within the first million years of the formation of the solar system, the solar system was divided into two reservoirs that did not exchange a lot of material amongst themselves. And this barrier was probably created by the formation of proto Jupiter. The inner solar system reservoir is known as the NC or the non carbonaceous reservoir, while the outer solar system reservoir is known as CC or the carbonaceous reservoir. Another thing we know about the initial architecture of a solar system is the large scale thermal, thermal gradient as a function of heliocentric distance in the protoplanetary disk. Temperatures were very hot closer to the sun, so volatiles that were present in the nebular gas could not condense in the form of ices. Well, as you go away from the, uh, away from the sun, these volatiles could condense in the form of ices. So it was assumed that protoplanets that accreted over here, they should be extremely volatile poor to almost volatile free. And the protoplanets that should be accreting in this particular region, they should be volatile rich. So the general idea that people had before was that these volatiles were delivered into the inner regions of the solar system to almost volatile free rocky bodies by scattering of this volatile rich carbonaceous like bodies when the, uh, when the giant planets migrated. So the first assumption I'm going to test in, uh, in, uh, in this talk were the first formed protoplanets in our solar system. That is the protoplanets that formed in the 1 million years of the formation of the solar system in the inner regions of the disk were they truly volatile poor or volatile free? To look at that, we need to look at the accretion time scales of different classes of planetesimals as a function of their as a function of the heliocentric distances. If you look at this plot, we see that the parent bodies of iron meteorites were the first formed planetesimals in our solar system. NC iron meteorites, that is the meteorites that form the inner regions of the disk, they started accreting as early as 0.1 million years of the formation of the solar system. And CC irons started accreting a little bit later. So if you want to understand the volatile bearing or the volatile poor nature of the inner solar system protoplanets, we need to look at the volatile inventory of iron meteorites. So what are iron meteorites? So iron meteorites are the remnants of the cores of the first formed protoplanets in our solar system. These protoplanets underwent differentiation by the decay of short-lived radioisotopes like 26 aluminum. So when we wanted to test the volatile inventory of these iron meteorites, we wanted to look at, we want to see whether we can check high, for hydrogen, carbon, or nitrogen. What we found for hydrogen was the, that there were a very limited number of measurements for hydrogen in iron meteorites. The issue for carbon was that there was limit, that there was very limited carbon isotopic variations in different groups of iron meteorites. So it was not easy to look at their provenance by looking at carbon isotopes. So we negated both of these techniques. So then what we did was we looked at the nitrogen contents and the nitrogen contents and the nitrogen isotopes in iron meteorites. And what we found was very, very interesting. So all these symbols over here represent different groups of iron meteorites. And each group of iron meteorites belong to a distinct iron meteorite parent body. What we see over here in this plot is, even though for a given group of iron meteorites, the nitrogen contents vary a lot, the nitrogen isotopic composition uh, have a plot in very distinct clusters, very small clusters. For example, if you look at the three AB group, the nitrogen contents vary a lot, but the nitrogen isotopic composition is a very distinct cluster. And also you see there are no clear correlations between the nitrogen contents and the nitrogen isotopic compositions of iron meteorites. So we can safely assume that the nitrogen isotopic composition of iron meteorites directly track the nitrogen isotopic composition of the primitive material accreted by their parent bodies. So then what we did over here was we plotted the nitrogen, average nitrogen isotopic compositions of different groups of iron meteorite as a function of their nucleosynthetic signatures. What we found over here was that nitrogen isotopic composition of the inner solar system iron meteorite was completely distinct from the outer solar system iron meteorites. And this dichotomy uh, was seen whenever we plotted nitrogen isotopic composition against any given nucleosynthetic signature. So this tells us a very important thing. So what we understand over here was not only there was nitrogen in, uh, not only the parent bodies of iron meteorites accreted nitrogen, 
but this nitrogen was sourced from a material from materials that were isotopically distinct relative to the outer solar system reservoir. That is, the nitrogen isotopic composition is 15 and poor, while the CCR and meteorites were 15 and rich. So the earlier assumption that people were making that the first form protoplanets, that, that is the NC protoplanets, should be volatile free, is not correct at all. So if we take this one step further and try to understand what is the cause of this nitrogen isotopic dichotomy, so we again need to look at the protoplanetary disk. So protoplanetary disk is primarily composed of gas and dust. So we wanted to understand whether the nitrogen in, that is present in the iron meteorite was sourced from the nebular gas or, or, or was sourced from the primordial dust. To understand this, we did some thermodynamic calculations. So what we did was we calculated the nitrogen solubility in the iron rich alloys as a function of the partial pressures. So what we found out was for partial pressures of nitrogen relevant for the nebular gas, the nitrogen solubility in the alloy by nebular ingassing is extremely small relative to the nitrogen abundances in iron meteorite, which safely tells us that nitrogen in the iron meteorite was not sourced from the nebular gas reservoir. The other way through which nitrogen can be uh, incorporated by the core forming metal is during core metal differentiation. So you accrete a planetesimal, which is primarily composed of organics and dust. And during differentiation, there is large scale melting. And when the core forming metal is uh, separating out from the magma ocean, some amount of nitrogen could be incorporated into the core forming metal. So then again, we did some thermodynamic calculations. As the core metal differentiation takes place at much higher pressures, the nitrogen solubility in the core forming alloy is significantly higher than the nitrogen abundances in iron meteorite. So what it tells us is that the nitrogen in the core forming metal was incorporated from either the primordial dust or the organics that were accreted by the parent body itself. So and we understand one more important thing that nitrogen in these parent bodies of iron meteorite what not, was not sourced from the nebular gas, but was sourced from, the, from primordial dust or organics that contain nitrogen, which indirectly tells us that nitrogen bearing dust or organics were present in the inner regions of the protoplanetary disk from the very beginning of the sol formation of the solar system. So if you take a step back now and try to understand the variation of nitrogen isotopes across the solar system, we now understand that there were three distinct nitrogen bearing reservoirs in the protoplanetary disk. One reservoir was extremely nitrogen uh, 15 and poor. Uh, that re reservoir is the nebular gas reservoir. And then there were two other nitrogen bearing reservoirs that were stored in the primordial dust or organics. The, one was sourced by the NC iron meteorites, that is the protoplanets that grew in the inner regions of the disk. And then there was a 15 and rich reservoir that was sourced by CC iron meteorites, that is sourced by the protoplanets that grew in the outer regions of the disk. When we plotted the nitrogen isotopic composition of the Earth's mantle and atmosphere over here, we found something really interesting. Nitrogen isotopic composition of the Earth's mantle and the atmosphere lies somewhere between the nitrogen isotopic composition of the NC and CC iron meteorites. So then what we did was we wanted to calculate the contribution of these NC and CC reservoirs to the nitrogen budget of the Earth. So what we found out was that both of these reservoirs contributed to the nitrogen budget of the bulk silicate Earth almost half and half. So what it tells us is that, that not only the NC protoplanets that accreted in the inner regions of the solar system, they not only accreted nitrogen, but the present day rocky planets also retain the memory of that particular nitrogen. So let me now take, shift some gears and move towards the other assumption that people generally think about. That is the nitrogen depletion in the rocky bodies. How did it, and I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer this question. So how did it occur? When did it occur? And what can it, what can it tell us about the origin and of nitrogen in the earth? So if you look over here, there's a very simplified plot that I've plotted over here that it shows the abundance of nitrogen normalized to some primitive chondrites. So rocky bodies are extremely nitrogen depleted relative to different classes of primitive chondrites. And what I mean by rocky bodies over here, I generally uh, assume the bulk silicate reservoirs of the rocky bodies, that the silicate reservoir, the mantles and the crust of the rocky bodies are extremely nitrogen depleted relative to the primitive classes of uh, chondrites. To understand the cause of this particular depletion, we need to look at the dynamics of planetary growth in the solar system. So in the nebular gas, there's primarily gas and dust exchange within the first hundreds to thousand years of the formation of the solar system. Then these dust particles collapse to form some, to, 
to, uh, to form planet, a rocky planet, undifferentiated planetesimals. And some of these planetesimals started to differentiate very early to form differentiated planetesimals. And then these differentiated planetesimals collided amongst themselves to form planetary embryos at larger time scales. And then these planetary embryos collided amongst themselves to form larger planet Earth. So what we wanted to do in this particular study was we wanted to understand the effect of the first differentiation step. Does, how does it affect the nitrogen distribution between the different uh, reservoirs of a differentiated rocky body? And this is basically like, as we see from iron meteorites, these differentiated planetesimals started to form very, very early. Although they form very early, we don't have a very good guess on what their sizes were. These differentiated planetesimals could have been very small, like Vesta-sized bodies, or they could have been larger moon to Mars-sized planetary embryo-sized bodies as well. So if you want to summarize what a protoplanet differentiation should look like is, if you look at an undifferentiated protoplanet, it accretes very early, due to the decay of 26 aluminum and other short-lived radioisotopes like 60 iron, there should be large-scale melting in this body. The large-scale melting should lead to the form of an, uh, of a uh, large-scale degassing from the body should lead to the form of magma ocean degassed atmosphere that overlays a magma ocean. And in the magma ocean, the metallic droplets are separately come from the silicate magma ocean to form the core. Or indirectly, all these reservoirs are in equilibrium with each other and nitrogen is exchanged among all these three reservoirs. Over long time scales, as these bodies are extremely small, they cannot retain their atmospheres. So finally, a differentiated protoplanet would look something like this with some nitrogen in its core and some nitrogen in its mantle while the atmospheres are long gone. So if we want to understand the nitrogen exchange between the atmosphere and the magma ocean, there have been a lot of studies which have looked at this particular, uh, the nitrogen solubility in the magma oceans as a function of, uh, of the oxygen fugacity. So this is oxygen fugacity relative to an oxygen fugacity buffer, like the IW buffer over here. What it simply means over here is as you move towards the right-hand sides, the conditions become oxidized. And if you move toward the left-hand side, the conditions are more reduced. What we see over here is what people have derived is the nitrogen solubility in the silicate melt is a function of partial pressure of nitrogen. So most, as you increase the partial pressure of nitrogen, the nitrogen solubility increases. And this is what you would expect from molecular solubility of nitrogen. But interestingly, for magma ocean-like conditions, what people find is, as at a given partial pressure, as you decrease the uh, oxygen fugacity, or you go to more and more reduced conditions, the nitrogen solubility in the silicate melt keeps on increasing. Because under these set of conditions, nitrogen starts to chemically combine with the silicate melt structure itself in the form of N3 negative or NH that bond with the silicon network. Another parameter we need to understand to truly uh, uh, develop an atmosphere, magma, ocean, and core forming metal is the exchange, the exchange between the metallic droplets and the alloy. This is generally done by experimental simulation of alloy melt, uh, alloy melt silicate melt equilibration. So what we do over here is we take some very small capsules, we put some metallic and silicate powders inside it, and then we melt them at high pressures and temperatures, and then we quench those experiments. And this is a typical quench experimental product. Over here, the white color represents the alloy, which is an analog of the core forming alloy over here. And this is the quench silicate glass, which is an analog of the silicate magma ocean. So what we can do is we can measure the nitrogen concentration in the alloy melt, the nitrogen concentration in the silicate melt, and we can understand how nitrogen fraction is between these two reservoirs as a function of very many different thermodynamic parameters like pressure, temperature, the redox gradient, and the alloy and silicate melt compositions. So when we did these experiments, so we plot over here, we see the partition coefficient of nitrogen between the alloy and silicate melt, which is simply the concentration of nitrogen in the alloy melt divided by concentration of nitrogen in the silicate melt as a function of redox gradient. What this plot shows us as we move, as we move from more oxidized to more reduced conditions, the partition coefficient of nitrogen begins to drop. And I want to uh, reinstate the point over here is that these blue color simple, uh, symbols represents the new experiments that we did and they were done for carbon poor, uh, for carbon poor alloys that are for more realistic core formation conditions. So what this shows us is that at oxidized conditions that is greater than IW minus four, nitrogen has an affinity for the metal or it is a cedrophile element. And as you go to more and more reduced conditions, nitrogen has affinity for the silicate melt because the nitrogen solubility in the silicate melts is extremely high under extremely reduced conditions. 
So then once we have these models, we want to do a coupled atmosphere, magma ocean, and core equilibration model to see the fractionation, the, the how nitrogen distributes from a differentiated planetis, uh, undifferentiated planetesimal to, uh, to the different reservoirs of a differentiated planetesimal. So what we see over here is the distribution of nitrogen in the magma ocean deep gas atmosphere, in the magma ocean, and the core of different planetesimals as a function of reef, uh, as a function of redox gradient. And as we do not have a good idea of what the size of these planetesimals were, we varied the size of these planetesimals between these uh, between small planetesimals that is the size of Vesta, that is four percent of the Earth's radius, or large planetary embryo-sized bodies, that is Mars-like planetary embryo-sized bodies. So what we find over here is for the redox gradient applicable for all dif different class of rocky bodies in our solar system, except Mercury and orbit parent body, the nitrogen, the magma oceans are extremely nitrogen depleted. Whereas for smaller planetesimals, most of the nitrogen is in, in their atmospheres over here, while for larger planetesimals, most of the nitrogen resides in the core. So what we show over here is that, that as we saw in the first particular study is that, okay, the inner, uh, inner solar system protoplanets, they accrete nitrogen, but during differentiation, you can still cause a lot of depletion of nitrogen in the bulk silicate reservoirs due to this protoplanetary differentiation. For smaller bodies, it's due to segregation of nitrogen in the atmosphere, while for larger bodies, a significant amount of nitrogen goes into the core. So what it shows over here is that the, that the widespread uh, depletion of nitrogen in the bulk silicate reservoirs is simply, uh, can be simply explained the very early protoplanetary differentiation. So we want to take it one step further. We want to see, okay, once we understand the, the large scale depletion of nitrogen caused by protoplanetary differentiation, can we say something about the dynamics of protoplanetary growth through the nitrogen budget of planetary embryos? So what I mean by over here is, okay, we do not know how the planetary embryo size bodies grew. They could either, uh, so either the uh, planetary embryo size bodies could accrete almost instantaneously, primarily composed of undifferentiated material, and then start to undergo differentiation. So, uh, and then you have differentiation, and then you form a differentiated planetary embryo. So this is the sort of a model that we discussed in the previous slides, that you have a large body or a small, that you have a body that grows almost instantaneously and then undergoes differentiation. However, a planetary embryo sized body could also grow from small, uh, small planetesimals that already had undergone differentiation. So for example, you have Vesta sized planetesimals that were already differentiated, then you could collide amongst themselves to form a large planetary embryo. So you want to see, okay, what can this different growth models of planetary embryos, how do they affect the nitrogen budget of the, uh, how, do they, how does it affect the nitrogen budgets? So if you look at the nitrogen budget of the magma oceans and the cores, of instantaneously created planetary embryos, this contains significant amount of nitrogen in the cores and some amount of nitrogen in the magma oceans. While planetary embryos that grew from already differentiated planetesimals, they are, their cores and their magma oceans both are extremely nitrogen poor. So what we wanted to see, okay, once we understand that, we want to see what growth mechanism uh, for planetary embryos is more applicable to our solar system. So we define a, a one scenario over here, that is a collisional accretion scenario. What is a collisional accretion scenario is asteroid sized bodies underwent differentiation, and then they formed planetary embryo sized bodies via collisional growth. In that kind of a scenario, the rate of differentiation is much greater than the rate of accretion that the bodies accrete, but as soon as they accrete to smaller size, they, they immediately start undergo differentiation. So if we try to form an Earth-like planet from this class of planetary embryos, we cannot explain the nitrogen budget of the bulk silicate Earth. We, what we find is they, 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 they cannot deliver enough amount of nitrogen to satisfy the nitrogen budget of the bulk silicate Earth over here. While in the other scenario, if you accrete a planetary embryo via instantaneous accretion, that a planetary embryo grows almost instantaneously to a pretty large size, and then that body undergoes differentiation, uh, then what we define in this scenario is that, that the rate of accretion, that the bodies grow very, very quickly, and then those bodies undergo differentiation. Under those kinds of scenarios, you can explain the nitrogen budget of the bulk silicate earth. So what it means is, if, 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 you, if, the, collisional, if the rate of differentiation were greater than the rate of accretion, then you should be, you should be forming extremely nitrogen poor to almost nitrogen free planets. And while if you have instantaneous accretion, that is the rate of accretion, 
for the planetary embryos was much greater than the rate of differentiation, then you should be yielding nitrogen bearing planets. And I think if we, for, for nitrogen budget of the earth, this mode of accretion was more prevalent for our solar system. So if I summarize our, our, our findings over here is, so what we shown in the first part of the talk is that the inner solar system protoplanets, they not only accreted nitrogen, but the nitrogen was isotopically distinct relative to the outer solar system reservoirs. And this nitrogen was primarily delivered due to the presence of nitrogen bearing organics or dust in the inner regions of the protoplanetary disk from the very beginning of the formation of the solar system. When we look at the nitrogen isotopic composition of the earth, it is composed of both inner and outer solar system reservoirs. So it also shows us that some amount of nitrogen requires to be delivered from the outer solar system reservoirs at much later time scales. And another thing that we showed over here is the nitrogen depletion in the bulk silicate earth. So what we showed is you do not necessarily need to start with extremely nitrogen free, almost nitrogen free planets to explain the nitrogen depletion. What we showed over here is protoplanetary differentiation, which should be ubiquitous across the solar system during the formation of the first formed planets, that this protoplanetary differentiation should cause extreme depletion of nitrogen in the mantles or the magma oceans of the first formed protoplanets. And another thing we showed over here is to explain the nitrogen budget of the bulk silicate earth, most of the planetary embryos that form the earth should have undergone instantaneous accretion. That is, they should have accreted to large size and then they should have undergone differentiation or indirectly for, pro for planetary embryos in our solar system, the rate of accretion was much greater than their rate of differentiation. Thank you. Thank you, Daman. That was uh, really interesting. So remember that we're going to have questions at the very end. So if you have any questions for Daman, please save that till uh, we have all the speakers. Uh, uh. And uh, now uh, all of our speakers have gone. So we're uh, opening it up to questions. So I think the chat should be open. And another option is to click the reactions button and uh, raise your hand then we can uh, ask you to unmute and you could ask the question uh, directly. And let's see, I saw that uh, Thomas Klein has his hand raised. So if you want to unmute and ask your question, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, I guess <clears throat> I'm trying to do my, I guess I can't change my video, but that's okay. Oh, unable to start anyway. Um, e e very interesting talks, both of them. I wonder if you could, any, either of you could make a few comments about the calculations of the temperature during the formation of the, the, or the rocky planets. As you have the dust particles and they cohere, is the driving temperature mainly kinetic uh, aspects of colliding or is it the decay of uh, uh, radioactive uh, elements. I'm a little bit confused how easy it is since it's really important the way things form early. Um, how good are the calculations of the temperatures of all these bodies that are uh, interacting to produce planets? Could you say a few things about that? Yeah. So basically, I think for the first, the, the smaller planetesimals and protoplanets that we have is the more the primarily heat sources, the decay of 26 aluminum, because I think the collisional energy is not sufficient enough to cause large scale melting. So, and uh, so I think, uh, and then uh, for larger bodies, uh, for then you, when you have these protoplanetary collisions amongst themselves, uh, so you could have, you could potentially have much higher temperatures that could be reached by uh, radioactive heating. So for example, for radioactive heating, the maximum temperatures that you could reach around is like 16 to 1800 degrees C. Uh, mm -hmm. While for, for while for uh, uh, for collisional growth, you could actually have much higher temperatures. But the interesting thing about nitrogen partitioning over here that we used in this particular model is it's not very sensitive to uh, any other uh, thermodynamic parameter except oxygen fugacity. So all our calculations uh, would be valid, uh, like even for our temperature range, say from uh, from a low temperature range from radioactive decay to a high temperature range for collisional accretion. So that's why we actually looked at nitrogen as a proxy because it's very sensitive to oxygen fugacity with very low sensitivity. The partition coefficient has very low sensitivity to all other given thermodynamic parameters. Oh, thank you, very interesting. Saw that uh, James Lyons had a question for Daman. So um, I think you can unmute yourself now if you'd like to. Yes, thank you, James. Uh, Daman, uh, excellent talk. And uh, actually both talks, really good. Um, I, I, I just wanted to remind everybody, Daman, about the fact that overlying 
the nitrogen isotope processes you're talking about is the process that moves the nebular gas from minus 400 per mil to even just minus 100 per mil for your NC uh, irons and, you know, to higher values beyond that. And uh, we, we don't understand all the details of that yet. And uh, that's, a, that's a major isotopic process, right? That's the N2 self-shielding process. At least that's what we think it is. And uh, I just, did, did you have any, any comments to add about yeah. that? It's yes, what well, yeah, working in the background on the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, like I think, as you said, I think uh, that that process when you go from the nebular gas and through these organics and you call this nitrogen isotope enrichment, that process is not super well understood. I think both of uh, I think uh, self shielding processes in the protoplanetary disk as well as self shielding processes in the molecular and 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 and, and isotope enrichment in the very low temperatures of molecular cloud has have been postulated to explain these. So like you could have uh, the, these, all these organics would have an interstellar origin. I think that's a lot of ideas that have been postulated by Connell Alexander or you, your ideas that you could actually have uh, uh, organics that could have cause this enrichment. So, we, so what, what we, we do over here is okay, we don't care. We didn't care at least in this particular paper, but I think in future papers, we're gonna work on these things. We said, okay, once you have that, and then uh, uh, once you have that in the organics, whatever the source of enrichment was maybe in the protoplanetary disk or was it in the in the in the molecular cloud itself and then do you see some isotopic dichotomy between the inner and outer solar system meteorites that's that's what the idea was in this particular paper but yeah i think those things have to be taken into consideration in the future okay so there's, there was another question for daman from uh, prachiti vitole and it says, uh, Dom, and it was very enlightening, though I'm wondering over uh, something very basic, I guess. Is this study entirely theoretical and computational as everything to be imagined is a bit of a task or do you check for practical stuff and uh, how do you go for it? Yeah, so basically I think uh, it's a valid point because there are not a lot of early earth samples that we can look at. And, but like if, if what we do in our studies is we look at, so all these nitrogen isotopic compositions that we were looking at and the nitrogen abundances, they're always compared to the meteoritic data. So this meteoritic data is the best uh, possible guesses that we have for the primitive building blocks on rocky planets and these iron meteorites are the real data. So these, all these data have been measured in meteorites. And again, the nitrogen isotopic compositions of the bulk silicate earth and and uh, and of the different uh, and the nitrogen abundance in the bulk silicate earth, they are also pretty well known. They have all measured data. So what we are trying to do is trying to link both of these things to a given processes. And for those processes, we develop the, all these theoretical exercises and do all these classes of experiments. But so and uh, uh, so the, the the data is real. What we are trying to measure, uh, what we are trying to compare with. But like the processes, we uh, the processes are like what we're trying to use uh, uh, to compare these classes of uh, uh, data sets over here. And what we do, the experiments are constrained. The experiments are done in a certain set of conditions, and uh, and those set of conditions are also also basically based on some other kind of measurements that people did in different classes of meteorite, like the peak, the what what is the pressure, temperature of alloy silica. So all those numbers are pretty well constrained, and those experiments are done in those set of conditions to set up a link between those two data sets and what were the processes that played an important role. Uh, so there was another question for Daman in the chat and it uh, says, uh, congratulations on your work. I was wondering, could the same accretionary theory be extended towards uh, the representation of carbon on Earth? Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, the thing is like, I think carbon and nitrogen are always cosmochemical twins or whatever, because I think they are present in the same organic matter. But like, all, of course, the geochemical, because I think carbon has a different fractionation behavior between the atmosphere and the magma and the magma and the core. And I think we are actually kind of doing these things right now for that. But I think broadly, the story would still kind of remain same for carbon as well, uh, because they always show similar kind of behaviors, but the nuances would change a little bit. Uh, okay, um, maybe I, I have a question for Daman. And it, so I guess it seems like when we're talking about origin of life, it, um, a lot of times it's uh, requiring some reduced gases in the atmosphere. And so if you're proposing that a lot of this volatiles are being, uh, or some of the volatiles on Earth can be accreting from the inner solar system, is that like a, a new source of reduced volatiles that could help with that or? So the, the thing is, right, like, so when we basically, what the, the idea is when we basically look at nitrogen and carbon, so all these different classes of meteorites, they all, the most of the nitrogen and carbon is hosted in the organic matter. 
the organic matter itself is extremely, uh, it's basically composed of hydrocarbons. Right? So all nitrogen and carbon are both in the reduced phases because nitrogen and carbon are more electronegative than uh, so hydrogen. So basically they're all, all in the more re reduced phases in there. But the thing is, I guess, like when you have these reactions, uh, uh, like, okay, of course, if you, if you kind of burn the meteorites themselves directly, you would actually be uh, uh, releasing a lot of these reduced gases. But I think what during this planetesimal differentiation, the speciation would actually depend upon the F02 set by this four mental differentiation exchange. But like based on the meteoritic record we have, if you, it, it doesn't matter whether you, uh, whether you are in the inner solar system or in the outer solar system, you would be releasing similar kind of gases because you're accreting similar kind of organics, both in the inner and outer regions of the proto uh, of, of the solar system. But I think this volatile speciation and all this kind of stuff, which would be set by, I think these volatiles would be actually kind of responding to these oxygen fugacity set by these different differentiation processes. Okay, thanks. So at the moment, I don't see any more questions in the chat or any hands raised. So I guess if uh, we don't have anything else, I, we can uh, end the session here. And I'd just like to uh, thank all the speakers again. Uh, thank you, Chen, Raj, and Daman for the uh, great talks. And uh, thank you to everyone else for tuning in, tuning in to uh, listen to them speak. And uh, we will be back in about three weeks. So uh, thank you to everybody. Thanks, James. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.